Your account balance is low. Please recharge. Uh, but uh, the host is George. Okay, Chief Manda. I think yes, we please. Can begin. Okay. Okay, we uh, can begin. Yes, now let me just uh, introduce you, then we can start. Okay. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's seven minutes after 17. Welcome to our weekly webinar series. And today, Sunday, 30th May 2021. Our presenter is um, Chief Kanyampa Manda, Deputy Chair Paper One. He is a man of experience. He is going to lead us through the topic, the teaching of poetry. As usual, we'll ask all of you, our participants, to mute your microphones while he presents. And like we always do, at the end of his presentation, we'll open the, a discussion for questions and contributions. So at this time, I give you Chief Kanyampamanda to take us through the teaching of poetry. Chief, you can take the stage is yours now. Uh, thank you, George, uh, for hosting me on, on, on this uh, uh, program. Um, my program, uh, my, my topic is entitled Just a Little poetry. And um, the structure of my presentation is as follows. I'll begin by uh, giving you a few readings of uh, short poems and excerpts from uh, you know, poems. Then uh, after that, I'll give uh, various definition of poetry as given by various poets and uh, scholars. Then I'll move on to uh, give my view as to why popular is, uh, sorry, as to why poetry is unpopular, especially with our learners, after which I will attempt to demystify poetry and uh, give suggestions as to how we can uh, make poetry a little more open and, and uh, attractive to our learners. So that, that is my, um, the structure of my presentation. Yeah, that's trial. Uh, we are moving on. Um, just a little poetry. And we are saying, ladies and gentlemen, that every speech act is a little poetry. As I said, I'm beginning with uh, uh, readings from uh, uh, various poetry. And the first one is entitled, Thy Self, Thy Kingdom. And there it goes. This one comes from my book entitled, uh, Recreation. Love thyself, to appreciate love, to love thy neighbor. So here, ladies and gentlemen, we are trying to say that uh, love comes, with, comes from within. If there's no love there, then it's difficult for us to export it to other people. So the beginning is uh, a bit on the selfish side. You love yourself, then you will know exactly what love is all about for you to export it to others. Uh, the next uh, helping, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, uh, war. Now, this was a speech given by Emperor Iris Selassie of Ethiopia 
the late Emperor Selassie of Ethiopia, in 1963 to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And it goes until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned everywhere is war. I think this is testimony enough, ladies and gentlemen. We have seen how the race issue has divided this world and how it has led to numerous wars. So we need to go back to those words given by Emperor Ayala Selassie, and, and we might want to learn here that uh, the, those words in uh, the speech war have been popularized uh, in a song which the late Bob Murray made uh, popular. And it, it would do if you went and read that. I'll move on to an excerpt from Mother to Son. It's a poem written by Langston Hughes. And uh, for you who read, you realize that uh, Langston Hughes is a big name in the Harlem Renaissance. Now, the Harlem Renaissance is a ghetto in the US where you find mainly the, the Negroes, you know? But because of such artists as Langston Hughes, we don't just find uh, blacks in the ghettos of the United States, but liberal whites were attracted because of the artistic um, nature of the programs that people like Langston use introduced there. It went with poetry, music, dance, and, and you can name it. So here goes uh, uh, Mother to Child by Langston Hughes. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tax in it and splinters and bold stone up and places with no carpet on the floor there. Here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Langston Hughes is talking about uh, a mother telling the son that uh, although life hasn't been easy, represented by no crystal stairs, let me try a bit of interpretation here. If you go to most of the malls that we have dotted around the country, we find uh, those um, uh, either lifts, you know, or the escalators. You just step on it and it moves you to your, to your destination. Now, here she's telling us life has not been like that. No crystal stair, you know, but the lesson is, son, although we have had these troubles, we can still make it if we persevered, if we are resilient. And that is how the blacks in the gates of America have actually you know, made it. The race issue has been very uh, harsh on their side, but because of their persistence and resilience, they have actually managed to find some place in, in this uh, life. Uh, we move on to, I wondered lonely as a cloud. Now, what is interesting here for me is the surname of uh, the poet William, the, 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 the poet who has written this poem, the name Wordsworth. We are talking about uh, the worth of words, which he actually um, found residence in himself as, as, as a poet. And we are saying, if we use the words well, if we use the words well, we can uh, use words as, as a currency that can actually drive us miles and, and places. So here goes, uh, I wandered lonely as a cloud. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd. 
a host of golden daffodils. Besides the lake beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Like I said, ladies and gentlemen, properly arranged, properly found words, it's currency that can move us miles and, and, and miles to places that, that we've never been. And in this particular case, we are uh, transitioning into the countries like our, our Zambian will say, Kufialo Fiampepo where there is ice, where there is snow, and, and so on and so forth. And we meet the golden daffodils, which we don't uh, find in, in Zambia, you know. But this is a reminder that uh, poetry brings us near to nature, very near to nature. And when we, we, we are talking about the daffodils, we are saying, just like the spring flowers, come and quickly go, but they leave a blessing behind that lasts, okay? They, 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 the flowers come and, and just disappear like that, but they leave a blessing behind. So that's, I wondered, uh, the lonely as a, as a cloud. We move on to, to be or not to be, that is the question. Now, this is William Shakespeare. And I am contending to you that uh, when we teach our learners poetry or literature in general, and we have not introduced lit, uh, Shakespeare to them, we have been unfair to them because uh, Shakespeare is a big name in, uh, in, uh, in literature and poetry per se. Um, is, is famous for so many uh, plays, so many poems, and, and the sonnet it was his specialty. So to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer, the slings and arrows of our treasure's fortune, or take the arms against a sea, a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them. Okay. To die to sleep. No more. And by sleep to say we end the heartache and a thousand natural shocks. That flesh is here to its consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep a chance to dream. We're saying to sleep a chance to dream. The importance of dreams, ladies and gentlemen, um, when we delve into dreamland, we are moving into a land of uh, possibilities. And um, people have said dreams are prophetic. Unfortunately, in this first life that we are living through, we are too fast to recognize the value of dreams, let alone try and see if we can interpret some, some of them. People have, that lived a uh, long time ago in the proper jungles, not in these concrete jungles uh, uh, we are living in today, they would have some peace of mind, some quiet place somewhere where they will sit and think about these things. Uh, think through the dreams that come through and they were directed to certain areas, to certain possibilities. And uh, in Africa, for example, all the drugs, all the medicines that are in the bushes and so on and so forth came through to us through those dreams, you know? So it is important to realize the importance of dream. And here we are saying to sleep, pay chance to dream. Because once we dream, then we have that potential to actually get into those possibilities. The next one, we are back to Kanyampamanda. This is again is uh, an excerpt from uh, my book, Recreation. And uh, the poem is entitled, The Power of love. Love is the tonic that gives life 
health, and vigor. And to be loved is the epitome that gives the swarm the pride of lions, the dream of living. So ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about love as uh, a predominant theme, not just in our, not just in literature, not just in poetry, but in our lives. You know, it's, it's a big thing. And, and we are saying it is the tonic, meaning it is the, um, the boost, okay? It actually boosts us, gives us life, gives us health, gives us vigor. And to be loved is the epitome. And uh, we are saying epitome is the essence, the personification, you know? So love is a tonic that gives life, health, and vigor. And to be loved is the epitome that gives the swarm, the pride of lions, the dream of living. Now, what is interesting here is, and if we can maybe preempt some discussion, we are talking about uh, the use of figurative language here. And uh, when we repeat uh, swarm, swarm is uh, normally um, um, associated with the bees, you know? And when you talk bees, you are talking honey, you are talking the, the hard work of, of the bees and all those things that are associated with uh, the bees. So that gives the swarm. Now, interestingly, we are saying well, that gives the swarm the pride of lions. When you picture the bees in a swarm, there's a zzz, that sound that comes through. Then you look at the lions, that combination brings in a new dimension of, of looking at things. And that is what poetry does. It's full of possibilities and it takes us into trying out things, you know, to make our lives better, so to speak. We move on to Eyes of Choice. This is another helping from Kanyampa Manda's book, Recreation. Um, in Eyes of Choice, I can quickly say that uh, we are talking about appearance and reality. And we are saying that uh, appearance is very different from reality. You know, what we see from outside from our appearance may be very different from the reality. And, and people have said uh, um, uh, appearances are normally deceptive. So for you to arrive at a concrete uh, interpretation of things, you need to move away just from the eyes and uh, join it with the mind perhaps, so that what you see is, uh, is um, taken to the mind and um, perhaps explained because the mind, will now make judgment, proper judgment, and tell you, no, Buana, this is just appearance and not reality. So you see something, you consult the mind or the brain, then you make a decision. Because as they say, all that glitters is not gold. So here is uh, eyes of choice, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my eyes of choice, my mind of deity, drive me deep and trouble. Shaky waters in the midst, sweet and flowers surpass. Oh, my eyes of choice, rescue me. I'm sure we've found ourselves, our eyes going back to that scene that may be repugnant or we may be committing a sin by looking in that direction, but the eyes will always go back there. As much as we try to look somewhere else, the eyes will find themselves there. That is why we are saying, oh, my eyes of choice, rescue me. So 
So that will do for the readings there. We'll now move uh, into our journey of this poetry um, presentation and try to see if we can attempt at defining poetry. And, and we'll look to Savan and Crean in their book, uh, Readings in Poetry. Savan and uh, Crean are saying, definitions in literature are not the easiest of things, as these tend to be tentative, being starting points, starting points for exploration and discussion. So we are saying in, in, in poetry or in literature, definitions are not things that are cast in concrete. They are tentative. They are just starting points for discussion. And, and perhaps to stress, to stretch that point further, people say that uh, oh, when we are teaching our, our students or our learners, we tell them that uh, there are no right or wrong answers in literature. And I say, no, that is not quite right. You know, there are of course right and there are wrong answers. And I'll say that if Chief Sinkala, for example, tells me that uh, this color is red, okay? And I am saying, and clearly saying that this color is actually green. But if Sinkala is able to convince me by proper explanation that actually this is red because of A, B, C, D, then fine, we'll go by, we'll go by that. But that, that does not shift my, you know, my standpoint, because I still believe this color is green. And I should also be able to tell Chief Lazaro that this is green because of uh, this and that. So as long as we are able to explain and give our point of view and convincingly so, then so be it. Red can be green and the green can be red. So that's about definitions uh, in literature. Um, they, they all the same give their definition and they are saying poetry is verse compositions in which rhythmical and usually metaphorical language is used to create aesthetic experiences and to therefore make statements which would be impossible to paraphrase in prose without loss in meaning and impact. And I want to put my stress on uh, impact there. We speak to create an impact, you know, so that uh, whatever we are saying is meaningful. And this is what we are saying here. Sometimes that cannot be achieved using prose. There's another suggestion here from our friend, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who uh, calls poetry as the best words in the best order. And that is interesting, the best words in the best order. And I want to put it to you that uh, there are no innocent words in any language per se. And as they say, all words are pregnant with meaning, you know? So that being the case, when we speak, we string our words in such a way that we bring out the base of what we want to communicate. Because if we are not careful, those words that we use those ways that are pregnant might come up with uh, trip, yeah? what, what do you call, uh, twins or trip, tri triple or let's or whatever. So several kinds of, uh, of meaning. So we must be careful as we communicate to 
place the best words in the best order so that we achieve that impact we talked about. That meaning that is clearly, um, you know, communicates what we want to communicate out there. Um, Samuel Taylor further says, uh, most of us find words to best describe things like the beauty. Sorry, most of us cannot find words that will best describe things like the beauty of nature or the sorrow of loss. It is the duty of the poet, therefore, to find the best words and describe things we all see and feel. We all see these things, we all see, uh, we all feel the sorrow of loss. Although not all of us can best describe that feeling. Uh, we move on to W.H. Oden, he's an English uh, American poet. And he says, first, it must be a well-made variable object that does not, that does honor to the language in which it is written, okay? A well-made variable object that does honor to the language in which it is written. Now, poetry is, is written in all sorts of languages. If every, as, as, we, as we must, now understand every language has poetry. And so we are saying this verbal arrangement must do honor to the language in which it is written and not butcher the language as it were. And I want to quickly mention some, uh, Simon, the late Simon Mwansaka Puepue, who wrote beautiful poetry in Ichiwemba. You know, now when you read through those poems, Ubuntu, Jambo, Jambo, Africa, Titua, Elela, Lelote, Titulave, we can forget, but we can never, we can forgive, but we can never forget what colonialism did to us. When you read those poems, indeed, Simon, the late Simon Mansaka Puepe, I think he was our first vice president in, in this country, did honor to the Ichibemba language. And, and I give my salute to our gallant Samo Mansa Kapoepo. <laughs> Secondly, it must sometimes, uh, it must be, it must say something significant about a reality common to us all, but perceived from a unique perspective. What the poet says has never been said before, but once it has, he has said it, his readers re recognize its validity for themselves. Is there someone in the Um, back to William Shakespeare. And he says, all the world is a stage and men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. His acts being seven ages. That's William Shakespeare. And, and uh, um, in that poem called uh, the seven ages, of course, seven ages of man, man generic. They, 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 they begins by birth, and then we, we move through all those stages. So at birth, we are fragile, you know, and we need support. But as time goes, we grow and mature, you know, and reach our peak. And once we reach that peak, of course, we begin to go down to the final destination, which is, of course, death or the passing through. And as we are going down the, you know, the last stages, we again 
fall into the fragile mode and again we will need support you know from two legs to three legs to four legs you know because we need that support at that stage oh. the world is a big stage is actually from a play entitled uh, as you like it uh, william wordsworth defines poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It is the poet's business to embody in their poetry the general passions of men. The function of poetry is to give pleasure to readers by presenting the incidents and situations of their lives in a fascinating and unusual way with a color of imagination. I want to comment on spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Now, sometimes you want to write a poem and it's not coming, you know? There are times when you struggle, you have an idea, you want to write a poem, it is not coming. Because according to William Wordsworth, it must be a spontaneous overflow of feelings. You know, if that spontaneousness, spontaneity is not there, it will not come. You can't force a poem out there. You end up uh, coming up with a formulaic kind of situation which will, have, uh, which will be devoid of those powerful uh, feelings. And again, we are saying, because we are all given to speech, all creatures that speak, as, as we say, have potential to be poets. But why do others easily find, find the poems and write them and others can note? Now the answer is simple. Because if you don't capture the moment, that sponta uh, spontaneous moment, if you don't capture it, you lose it. It's like uh, dreams. You have a powerful dream at night and you wake up. If you don't capture it there and then, you will lose that powerful thought clearly. That is why powerful journalists, powerful poets always live with a pen and paper by their headboard. So when that uh, feeling comes, when that uh, overflow of powerful feelings come, they put it down on paper immediately. And that is how we benefit from that uh, kind of commitment by poets who actually capture those moments of our lives, you know, that others will simply let pass by. And, and we are saying there's an agreement here with the great Aristotle that poet is the most philosophical of all writings. The subject of poetry, ladies and gentlemen, is general and operative truth, which is its own testimony. Truth doesn't need explanation because it is its own testimony. And that's what we are saying is poetry. You know, it's operative truth, which is its own testimony. And people have, uh, jokingly said it's very easy to talk about uh, to tell the truth but very difficult to tell lies because truth is its own testimony and when you tell one lie you have to sustain it you have to keep lying in order to sustain that moment yeah according to jesse smith an eminent critic, the nature of poetry will appear more clearly when we have considered its end or purpose or its function or the function of the poet in a civil society. Poets, ladies and gentlemen, are not just ordinary people. You know, they are an important element in our societies. In German, these are called birds. In Mali, they are called the grills. In Zambia, in Ichibemba, they are called ingomba. They are the repositories of our histories. 
They don't write it down, but they keep it within, you know, their, 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 their substance. And they recite these out to bring out those rich feelings, those rich histories of, of our lands. And that is why uh, every chief in the village has a poet or poets that actually are called uh, to actually, you know, sing songs and praises. The Bible had, uh, is it, uh, what's the name again? The first musician, was it David? He used to sing out, you know, the poems. That is the function of the Ingom, but you find them in Chief Mpezeni's clan, uh, a, a, a palace, you find them in Kwakazembe, we find them in uh, with the Litunga. They are there because they are so important. They keep the histories of uh, our, our countries. When we return to Coral region and, and, and we say that the best words in the best order, in fact, that's the definition of human speech. We will go back to this, uh, this string of where's the best order, the best words in the best order over and over again. Let me take you to, let me give you a, visual, a, 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 a picture of uh, a duck and the ducklings. Just picture that in your minds. And um, this duck, his mother duck, has maybe 10, 12 ducklings and they are moving. Just imagine that, that scene. It's, it's a beautiful scene. When we move away from the duck, we move away from the duck and we come to the nuns in the nunnery. I'm sure we've all seen the Catholic nuns. When they walk, it's the best words in the best order. A nun doesn't just walk anyhow. One put one foot in front and then the other. No. There is grace in that movement. You know, just as much as uh, there is grace in that duck, duck and, and duckling. And perhaps we, we can also give the example of the, the nurse in the hospital. A nurse doesn't just walk anyhow, there is a rhythm in that movement, you know? So back to the best words in the best order. Otherwise, if we jumble up the words, then we will not appreciate that movement of the nurse in the world and then the word hospital word, and perhaps the patient will not recover. So humans, be it in politics, academia, and ordinary life, speak to be felt, to effect, to affect, to influence acceptance, you know, celebration and dominance. On, on, on a light note, perhaps we, we will talk about uh, a young man who wants to propose love to a lady. They don't just go, you know, on impulse. They will calculate their moves and they will not make a move when they are not sure they are going to win. Okay? Let's make a move. It follows there for that as long as we are given to speech, we are poets waiting to be published. So every human being, because they have speech, is a poet waiting to be published. Because when we speak as human beings, we, just, we don't just speak anyhow. We properly string our words because as the English say, it is not what you say that matters, but how you say it, you know? So, the best words in the best arrangement. So all those who speak are in effect poets through the use of language. And Shelley says, poets are those who imagine and express the everlasting order are not only the authors of language and of music, 
and of dance and of architecture and of sculpture and of painting. They are, they are the institutors of laws and the founders of civil society and the inventors of the arts of life and the teachers. What more can we say, ladies and gentlemen? That's how important the craft of poetry is and that's how important the poet is. That's how important you are as people given to speech. So a poem, ladies and gentlemen, is the very image of life expressed in its eternal truth. And as I said earlier on, truth doesn't lie. But perhaps you can also say, unfortunately, truth is always, you know, always frowned upon because very few people want to accept the truth. As they say, the truth hurts. The ideological formulation of a poet as a truth bringer is here exemplified from Shelley's poem, Ozymandias. I don't know if we have uh, read that poem, ladies and gentlemen, uh, by Ozymandias. Um, Shelley is talking about the temporariness of uh, political life. That political life is very temporal, you know, and uh, it quickly fizzles out. As long as you have lost the magic, you have lost that influence that you had. And as long as a new leader comes through, you are forgotten about. But what about your works? What about what you stood for? Are we surely just going to forget like that? So now, Shelley wrote the poem Ozymandias, which is actually a statue, a fallen statue. We have uh, a leg flown out, we are concrete, you know, this is a statue broken. The idea is, as much as these people have come and gone, let the history remain. It is important that um, we put up uh, statues that will remind us of our history. As we say, people without a history are dead, are literally dead, because they don't know where they're coming from. And if you don't know what you're coming from, it's difficult for you to know where you are going. As the saying goes, we are men of the present, uh, we are men of the past, living in the present, moving on to the future. We are men of the past, living in the present and moving on to the future. And uh, those of you that listen to reggae music, that should remind, me, uh, remind you of Peter Tosh, men of the past, living in the present and moving on to the future. That's the importance, that is the essence of uh, the poem Ozymandias. I met, him, I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell its captor. Well, those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. So that's the statue that has fallen. And uh, this brings me, um, happened to be in Blawayo once upon a time when uh, Robert Mugabe, the president of, uh, the late president of Zimbabwe was unveiling the statue of Joshua Nkomo, you know? And on that day, Mugabe unveils it and the beautiful statue stands up there of uh, Joshua Nkomo. Now we all know 
what Joshua Nkomo did in that struggle for the Zimbabwean independence, although he never got a chance to rule that country, you know? But as they say, those that struggle the most, those that contribute the most do not necessarily become the leaders, you know? But they've played their role, you know? And that should be remembered. And, and thus, if you went into blood right now, you'll see that beautiful golden sculpture of uh, Joshua Nkomo. Still on the subject of statues, I've seen, I'm sure you've uh, seen in the past, in the recent past, how statues are being brought down because they identify, they, 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 because the people feel those people should not be honored with such statues because of what they did in the past. Now, whether we want to keep the statues or destroy them is not for me to answer. But we are saying history is very, very important. We need to have some history of, of some kind. Um, then we are saying, I now move on to the reasons why our learners find poetry difficult to actually uh, work with. Number one, I'm saying poetry suffers from an image problem. Poetry suffers from an image problem. Uh, from where we are coming from, people have said, Poetry is difficult, you know? Just like people would say, maths is not for ladies. Maths is a difficult subject. That's the image problem. It seems a tricky form, seductive in its rhythm, rhythms and radical language, but teasing and withholding. I'll, 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 I'll go over that again. It seems a tricky form, seductive in its rhythms and radical language, but teasing and withholding. And I want to give the image of the winter sun at Mujoni in Zambia, we say, there's that sun which is, uh, when it is coming, that we, 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 we experience, we feel the heat, you know, but it is coming and going, you know, we want to follow it up and, and, and you know, get the heat from the sun. It is seductive. It is teasing us. It is coming and going. And I'm sure you, 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 you can, you have experienced that. You want that sun, it's there in the clouds and it's coming, you know? But when you feel like you are getting warmed up and you're getting comfortable, it, with, it goes back, teasing and withholding. So that's the other thing. Prose writing, by contrast, can appear straightforward, honest, even when conveying its sense of meaning. You know, straightforward uh, narrations. Poetry is the Sphinx, an Egyptian ancient stone statue, the creature of human head and the body of uh, a lion lying down. In ancient Greek stories, the Sphinx spoke in riddles talking in riddles and clothes regarding its secrets. And all of us in one way or the other, we don't want to volunteer all the information about ourselves. And that is why when we are growing up, there are those, we, we used to call them autographs where we wrote small little things about ourselves, which we didn't want to share with others maybe because um, you are experiencing a heartbreak. Is it a heartbreak? No, a broken heart, for example. And you note it down there to remind you that perhaps it is healing as you are writing it down. But you don't want anybody to, to read, you know, those uh, secrets about yourself. We used to call these the secret uh, notebooks. 
And, uh, but of course, a naughty younger brother or sister will get it from under the pillow where you have kept it, and they will read through. And then they go, ah, so this is what is happening. Now, because you don't want to make it obvious, you kind of uh, lock it in a kind of, um, in a kind of uh, secret code so that only you as the key to unlock the, um, the message in there, you know? So that is the other thing we want to say about poetry, not straightforward like prose, but like the secret notebooks, you want to keep it guarded. When confronting students about their fears, and get the sense they think of poetry as far too clever and uh, the risk of misunderstanding and of getting it wrong is very high, you know? You want that girl in the corner, you want to propose love to her, but you are scared that she would say no and of the embarrassment that will come thereafter. And I want to say this, that men know this very well. We don't just approach any woman anytime, you know? We make our calculations. When you think, aha, now is the right moment, that's when you, you strike. Like they say, strike the hammer while it is hot. Then it, it becomes malleable and you can shape it in, in whatever way it is. But the ladies will tell you that uh, it is not that way. It is because when she says yes, she has been, you know, she has been, you know, crafting it through and through, making it easy for you to come through and, and present your manifesto. So when you think you have uh, hit, you know, the nail on the head, you are just falling into the trap that he has already set up for you. Our learners also complain of feeling disconnected from the poetry that they've encountered so far. Now let's keep that weight. Disconnected from the poetry they've encountered so far. Now that brings in the element of the teacher. What poems have you given to the learners, that would make them feel disconnected, you know? So that is your responsibility there. Now, this is particularly true of contemporary literature, you know, where the tradition of dead white middle-class men still holds fast. Oh, poetry is not for everybody. It's high society, you know? So because of that same issue, they cannot identify with it and the participation becomes a problem. And uh, we are saying when a learner is separated from a poem, not only by obstacles of technical form and language, but also by a gulf of years and a strange cultural context. So context becomes crucial there. You give a a, a, a poem to the learners, which has uh, a very foreign context, for example, it becomes very difficult for, for them to go along with you. In our current school setup, for example, uh, where, you know, learning is dominated by league tables and exam results, teachers resort to interpretations of poetry. You know, when they give a poem to the children, to, to the learners, they come with an interpret already made interpretation and then give that to the learner. Remember we said poetry is the spontaneous overflow of emotions. Always the spontaneity if you are going to bring a, a already made interpretation. Let Lazaro, Chief Lazaro, remain with his red and let Kanyampamanda remain with his green because it's spontaneous. We kill, you know, and butcher 
the spirit of poetry if we are going to come with that ready-made interpretations. And, and, and I'm sad when we read through our social media as literature and languages uh, uh, teachers, these are the questions that are always asked in those fora. Can you please send me the answer to this poem? Can you please do this? Can you, you see that just kills poetry. That spontaneous overflow of emotion is no longer there and the children will look at it with suspicion and it does not help. If anything, these solutions are just memorized, regurgitated in the exam hall and forgotten about as soon as the session is done. They hate the experience, never wanting to return to that avenue ever. We have killed, you know, the mood. We have killed poetry. They will do the exam fine, but they will never return to that ever again. They will go with that forensic, uh, uh, Post, what has happened? George. George, can you come through? Hello, George. Yes, Chief. Can you come through? What has happened? Uh, at first, I thought maybe my... <clears throat> Maybe someone was calling me. Let me check. I think it's his. Uh... Oh. Has, or maybe he has run out of bundles, right? It's possible. Yeah. Let me pause the. the, the yeah, just pause it. Let me call him. Okay.